Hi everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the RNF Summit 2021. I'm just gonna double check with Reed. You can see my screen. Yes, I can see your screen. Perfect. So welcome everyone. My name is Anuni Callagher and I'm one of the co-chairs for this conference planning or summit planning committee. And I'm also joined by my fellow co-chair. Hi everybody, my name is Rita Suji and I am the other co-chair for the committee. And uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to say hello and welcome and thank you everybody for, for signing in. Uh, I know we're all in different time zones and we're glad to, to have you here. Uh, so, um, as you know, this is the first, or as you may not know, this is the first virtual RDAP uh, annual summit uh, this year. And the summit has always been a, a wonderful you know, gathering of data professionals from various academic institutions, libraries, research centers, nonprofits, and government agencies. And, and even though we're online, uh, this year's gathering is no different. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to learn and, and experience, you know, our, our networking, uh, you know, of course, as much as possible being online and to, to enjoy some, some great presentations. Uh, the theme for the summit is radical change in data, um, which, you know, basically states how, how professionals, you know, like us who work with, with data uh, have responded to current and emerging trends. Um, the, the new skills or knowledges, you know, that we've learned, um, over, you know, say the past year or throughout our careers. And, and now as we're all adapting to changes in our work um, and, and the profession, uh, there's, there's a lot that, that people would want to know or, or that we want to learn. So uh, it's great that, that we can join uh, and be here today. So with that in mind, uh, we're looking forward to the uh, full schedule of interesting and um, exception, exceptional presentations that we have uh, lined up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, you can find the schedule here at the link, uh, on this link, uh, which is the uh, main RDAP Summit website. And the full presenter and summaries are also listed on that site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'd like to just quickly review some logistical information uh, for the summit and some other important information uh, you will need uh, to know for the duration of the summit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, uh, Please use the uh, schedule uh, on the RDAP uh, Summit website. And I believe um, everybody has received a document that contains uh, web links to all of the webinar sessions. And, um, and that, that's actually what you can use as, as your general schedule to kind of follow along and keep track of um, you know, how we're clicking throughout the, the days uh, for each of the webinars. Uh, we do have a uh, RDAP Summit Discord server set up, uh, which will basically be the primary communication channel for the summit. Uh, so please join the Summit Discord using the invite link. Uh, and if there's any questions or comments or you just want to network with some other people, um, please use that space to do so. Uh, we do have Summit Committee members that are monitoring uh, the Discord space. Um, so again, if you have any questions about the conference or how things are going, um, you can contact the, the committee members there uh, as well. And if you use uh, social media, please follow RDAP. Um, our, our Twitter handle is there. And then also uh, use the hashtag uh, RDAP21. And then uh, there's also another space that's running uh, just for today and it's called Gather Town. And it's a fun interactive uh, area where you can um, sit down and have discussions with some of the sponsors. And then also again, use the space to network uh, with, with other people who are in attendance. So please check that out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
one thing that we definitely want to put emphasis on is that uh, we do have an RDAP code of conduct that we will follow, uh, which basically um, is where uh, us as the summit organizers are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully uh, in the program and activities without fear of any harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. Um, if you'd like to read the full code of conduct that is available on the RDAP Summit website. And in the case of uh, any violations or any issues that come up, uh, you can, again, use any of the various communication channels uh, that you see here on the slide, which are also posted on the Summit website uh, for access. Uh, but you can also contact um, our CEOs, our Code of Contact volunteers, who will also be monitoring Discord, and they will also be uh, in attendance uh, during all the panels. So again, if anything comes up and there's immediate concern, you can contact our uh, Code of Conduct volunteers volunteers. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, for the last bit of uh, logistical information, um, some of the sessions uh, will be recorded, or I'll say the majority of the sessions will, will be recorded, uh, and the presentation materials uh, will be available on an OSF for Meetings site uh, later on, and uh, we will be sure to share that link with you. Um, as soon as we, we have the, the space available and ready to post the uh, summit uh, content there. And yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll hand the mic off to Amelia for some information about our, our sponsors and scholarships and our committee members. Great, thank you, Reed. So we want to acknowledge the sponsors who helped make this summit possible. We had a number of sponsors in a couple of different tier categories we want to acknowledge. So we want to thank our Trailblazer sponsors, the National Library of Medicine, Ex Libris, Big Share, Purdue University, um, Libraries and School of Information Studies, the University of Arizona University Libraries, and Spark. We also want to thank our change agent, change agents and innovators sponsors, the Digital Scholarship at Colgate University Libraries, I assist the Information School at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, University of Illinois Library, Iowa State University Library, and the Libraries of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Your generosity and support made this summit happen. Um, and we couldn't have been here without your support. We also want to acknowledge and recognize our scholarship recipients. This is the first year the summit was able to offer scholarships through our sponsors. So Syracuse University School of Information Studies, Big Share, Northeastern University Library, as well as generous do donations from various product members who gifted scholarships when they registered for the summit, allowed us to offer almost 30 scholarships um, for attendees to join us at this year's summit. And so we recognize our scholarship winners on this slide. We're happy you could join us for this summit. We also want to thank our RDAP committee volunteers from all of the other action committees. Everyone uh, in all of these committees helped make this summit possible. So we want to thank the web committee, sponsorship committee, marketing committee, the membership committee, the education committee, publishing committee, and of course our RDAP executive board for all of their help in putting together this summit. We also want to send a special thank you to our very own conference planning committee. Um, Katie, Melissa, Tess, Laura, Kim, Rebecca, Fernando, Megan, and Amy. Reed and I are so thankful for all of your help and support and the effort that you put into getting this summit going, especially pivoting to a virtual summit, which we've never done before. So I hope you're proud of yourselves. We are very proud of you. Um, we cannot thank you enough for all of the effort and hard work you did in putting this summit together. And now before I introduce our opening keynote, we're gonna hear from our keynote sponsor. So bear with me for one second while I switch my screens.
I'm just going to ask Reed, can you see the blank video about to play? Yes, I see the play. Okay. In March 2020, our lives were dramatically changed as the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world. The virus has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of our loved ones, pushed our healthcare infrastructure to its breaking point, ravaged our economy, and changed how we conduct business, education, and commerce. Together, we have adapted, innovated, and persevered. Like other universities, Purdue initiated efforts using the latest scientific data available to protect our campus to create a safe environment for students, staff, and faculty. We created a COVID-19 dashboard, implemented diligent campus testing, created a quarantine protocol for students in on-campus housing, and started contact tracing. We provided students and staff with wellness kits, face masks, and offered e-learning opportunities in a remote work environment. While COVID may be keeping us physically apart, it has brought the world together in a common cause, and it's not that different from the plot of a superhero movie. Defeat the virus and save the world. Our heroes don't wear capes or fight with hammers, but they are just as powerful to us, and our hopes for a better, safer world lie with them. Data are being curated and shared at a rate that is unprecedented across countries, governments, industries, and disciplines. Data helped create the timeline of virus discovery and aided major scientific breakthroughs. And you made it possible. Medical researchers, government agencies, companies, and universities working together and sharing data. Data that are well documented and described. Data that are authentic, verifiable, and can be reproduced. Data that have integrity and have been properly stewarded. Data that are findable, accessible, and open. Data that are interoperable. Data that can be trusted. To the data and information professionals who make it all possible, thank you. Most importantly, to the millions of healthcare workers tirelessly fighting on the front lines, risking their own health to save others, we thank you. The pandemic will end, but you will forever remain our heroes. Welcome to the RDAPS Virtual Summit. Enjoy the programs. Figshare is an easy-to-use research data repository system that allows academics to make all of their research outputs available in a citable, shareable, and discoverable manner. It also allows research data managers to manage the curation of files, keep account of their institution's research outputs, and measure the impact of those outputs. You can quickly and easily upload any file on Figshare, from PDFs, papers, and datasets, to code, 3D printable files, and video. 
You control the ownership, the storage, the DOIs, the licenses, and the metadata. And we take care of the rest. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first panel. I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Fernando, to get us started. Good, uh, thanks, Amelia. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending panel one, Responsible Data Practices at the 2021 RDAP Summit. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some logistics. This is a Zoom webinar and attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. This session will run from 1020 to 1120 Pacific with the last 15 minutes or so for Q&A. We also have a Discord server set up for more informal conversations running throughout the summit. Please feel free to continue the discussion or conversation on that platform. In regards to the code of conduct, the RDAP organizers are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. There is a code of conduct helper available, available during the session, Amy Arnell or Laura Lulligan, that you can identify with a COC helper tag next to their name. And you may contact them if you need assistance. Okay, so let's uh, move to our first presenter. Uh, first, we'll hear from Laura Woodbrook from the University of Michigan. And as a reminder, you'll all have 15 minutes and you'll get an audio notification at three minutes and one minute remaining. Okay, Rachel, uh, go ahead. Mike is yours. Thank you, Fernando. Sorry, I was trying to set up things on my computer and the, the Zoom window disappeared. Um, can folks see my uh, first slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so as Fernando said, um, I'm Rachel Woodbrook. I'm the data curation librarian at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to be talking today about a project that um, the University of Michigan Library has been doing in collaboration with uh, the National Center for Institutional Diversity. And if you'd like to follow along, I do have my slides up um, and they'll be posted on OSF after the conference. So for this short talk, I'll briefly cover the main areas of our project. I'll point to a few places that you can get more information about the project if you're interested. Um, and of course, I'm also happy to talk with anybody um, who's interested as well. And before I get started, I wanted to recognize that the context we're in is currently not business as usual still in so many ways. And to thank everyone for making time to join us here at this panel and also at the conference and to thank Dr. Sutherland for that amazing keynote. Um, and with so much of our work happening online, it can be easy to feel even more disconnected from place. So I also wanted to acknowledge that I grew up in, and I'm speaking from unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish tribe, um, and to recognize the tribe's continued fight for restoration of their federal recognition. Generations of Seattleites continue to benefit from the Duwamish people's presence and stewardship of this land. And um, if anyone else is in the area and hasn't heard about it, the Real Rent campaign is one way to acknowledge the lack of just access to the resources of their homeland, excuse me, and to support the tribe as an integral part of the city today. So in terms of this project, um, really it grew out of an existing relationship with NCID and then an identified need. Uh, NCID, the National Center for Institutional Diversity, is a center at the University of Michigan that funds, produces, and supports diversity research and scholarship and seeks to build intergenerational communities of scholars and leaders. So they're very supportive of and interested in public scholarship and have a pre-existing relationship with the library. And in mid-2018, we were having some conversations with them around their data and um, came up with the fact that 
if they were having challenges deciding and making decisions about what to do with it, probably the researchers that they work with needed more support as well. And at the same time, around this time, I'd been looking for resources to bring more questions around data ethics generally into like the general data management education that I was doing. I think at that point it was, you know, a few bullet points on data security and IRB, but it really felt like there were critical gaps in what we we're addressing because every stage of the data life cycle has ethical implications. And with the growing number of funders and institutions moving towards um, data sharing and acquiring data sharing in some cases, it's more important than ever to know what resources were available to support researchers and to help them feel prepared to make decisions. But it wasn't always clear where this support would be coming from. And I had a hard time finding the type of introductory research resources that I was looking for. So from this conversation, um, developed the idea for a toolkit and then research to inform it. And this was also a really great opportunity to build on the relationship with NCID and to draw on a wealth of knowledge and experience from scholars um, through the Diversity Scholars Network, which NCID created and coordinates. And this is a group of about 900 scholars, um, mostly in the US, whose research focuses on issues of equity, inclusion, and justice. So they're already thinking about these considerations um, and many of the things that we were interested in around data from a lot of different angles in their own work and are deeply invested in using their work to create change. And we also thought it was possible that if there were resources that we didn't know about but were available, we might be able to hear about it from them. So for the project, much of the work we did would not have been possible without the support of Lyricists, from whom we received a Catalyst Fund Award, um, and a later part of this project is also supported by an ALA Diversity Research Grant. For our research, we decided to use the Diversity Scholars Network as our research sample and audience, and then to use an exploratory mixed methods approach. So doing a literature review, some interviews, and a survey, um, to inform the creation of the toolkit. And then everything went smoothly and exactly as planned. Um, in all seriousness though, this was my first time as a PI and with all the ways the last year has been really atypical and exacerbating existing stressors and challenges. The research team have been amazing and one of the best parts of the project and they're listed in full. We have past and current members um, on our website that I'll link to later. So for the project then, our overarching research question was what implications do diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility considerations have for best practices in each step of the data life cycle? And that covers a lot. Um, as a starting point, we use the University of Michigan Library's definitions of the EINA um, to start thinking about how these concepts apply directly to data management. And the other structure that we used to shape our project was the data life cycle. I'm sure most of you here will be familiar with that. Um, we created a simplified version for this project. And then before beginning our research, we laid out each step of the life cycle and brainstormed the types of activities and decisions that could have um, ethical implications or that could be informed by DEI and A principles, as well as thinking about what kinds of support might be useful to, to offer. Uh, so we were really intentionally broad in our language and approach, and part of that was also due to the fact that um, most of what we found was, I would say, adjacent, but not like right in the area that we were looking at. So we had to be pretty broad. And on that line, the literature review was pretty challenging. Uh, again, this was back in 2018. There was a lot of adjacent literature, but not that much on the intersections we were looking for to draw from. Um, but the two main bodies of literature we ended up looking at were around DEIA and diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in research, and then research data management. Uh, and within these, we did find several areas of overlap that address the topics we were interested in, um, specifically indigenous data governance, literature on community data organizations, emerging critical data practices, participatory and emancipatory research, archives and social justice and research ethics. And of course, um, that covers a lot more than we could ever read. But the fact that it was sort of difficult to pinpoint things 
helped us confirm that even though writing and resources probably did exist, they weren't necessarily centralized or easy to locate and apply. Um, accessibility in particular was an area where it was, we really struggled to find good material. Um, and so we also ended up doing an environmental scan and finding resources through references and conversations. Uh, for example, the Our Data Bodies project is one that I heard about through a conversation. We did though find some overall themes um, across the resources and those held throughout the rest of our research too. Um, a lot of these had to do with an emphasis on process over product, the critical importance of context and relationships and trust. Um, there were lots of new terminology springing up. Um, Dr. Sutherland was talking about um, digital remains. I don't remember which source this was from, but data fumes uh, is something that that reminded me of that we came across as well. And also discussions um, around agency and data ownership versus stewardship, who makes data decisions. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things that were really well illustrated with a lot you know, specifics in Dr. Sutherland's talk, I would say, in terms of um, what can happen and create areas of conflict or harm. Um, this is very high level. We have a manuscript we're working on for submission that goes into things in more depth. And there have been a lot of introductory resources made available in the last few years, especially last year um, after the events of last summer with George Floyd and with um, the aftermath of um, what happened there and 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 then the increased focus on anti-racism in area all areas including research and data um, there's been a lot a much needed spotlight thrown on a lot of these questions and areas and so I know that we um, have catch up to do on some additional resources and scholars that have excuse me um, been producing things since we started the project and all that to say, this was not a comprehensive review or highly systematic, but it was a place to get us started. So we did 12 semi-structured interviews. And from those, we got a more nuanced understanding of how researchers' own identities impacted their decisions. Uh, for example, some anticipated facing additional scrutiny because of their identity or um, additional or heightened um, risk of potential harm to their participants from misuse of the data if it was shared. So trust and relationships, again, were a large theme. Um, we also heard a lot about pressures around time and resources to obtain the right tools to do the work of planning that would enable not having to cut corners later on or being able to do what they had wanted to do with the data at the end of the project. And there were also challenges around decisions of where to present their research. So journals with high impact factors, not necessarily accessible formats for research participants, but the amount of work it takes to prepare and share data back to communities in useful ways was sometimes seen as a large investment for less direct benefit to those communities. Um, and this is a quote from one of our interviewees. It just seems like a much lower priority goal um, that is preparing and sharing back the data than trying to do good science that helps people in trouble. And there's a lot to say about this, but I think it does point to the idea that openness without a specific intention and goal and understanding of purpose um, might not be worth the effort. So for the surveys, we built our protocol around three main questions, uh, but I will also say that we launched the survey in April, 2020, right as the pandemic kicked in. So I was really excited that we almost hit our goal of 150 responses. Um, the first question we were trying to answer was where do diversity researchers feel the most and least comfortable with data lifecycle actions? And so what we did was we showed respondents a list of data stages. On this slide is um, the text we used for data sharing. So it would have the term, a brief description, and then some examples of actions that might be taken at that stage to help make it more concrete, because a lot of this is pretty abstract. And then we asked respondents to choose the best example of a stage that was important and they were comfortable with it and one that was important, but they were uncomfortable with it. And we decided to focus on researcher perceptions of comfort because this seemed still likely to affect their motivation to use a toolkit um, and a little bit easier to try and measure than objective data skills, which would just be such a broad range and really difficult to assess. And here's a, one summary of some of our results. You can see here stages most often chosen as important and comfortable 
for data collection, data processing and analysis, and finding existing data. And then the ones most often chosen as important but uncomfortable were data sharing and data archiving and preservation. Again, this is extremely high level, and we actually have another manuscript we're working on, but I think many of us will recognize these areas of discomfort as areas that libraries and other central campus resources often target for support. They're at the end of the research life cycle. They may be difficult to focus on or to wrap up with time pressures to move on. And that especially depends on how much time people were able to put in at the beginning in planning. So clearly more support is needed. The second research question we were trying to understand was how likely scholars were to use a toolkit if they felt it was necessary and what factors might correlate with that likelihood. We didn't find any demographic correlations, but almost everyone did say that they would be likely to use such a toolkit. Um, the main barrier they saw to using it would be limitations on time and resources. And then lastly, we wanted to get a sense of what types of resources they would find most useful. So we had a list of 10 potential types of resources. The top three are here, um, again, with descriptions and examples to help make things more concrete and specific. Um, and so the top three that people chose were successful examples of engaging communities in research, design, and data governance, a checklist of questions for making decisions throughout the process, and templates for one-page data applications or data use agreements um, to provide context and guidance if they were to share their data. Rather than trying to be comprehensive, um, we realized we needed to focus on making it easy for scholars to find the resources that are relevant to them in the toolkit. Um, so currently we are working on exploring our platform options and then working with the list of resources we've identified over the course of the project. We currently have around 50, we're categorizing them according to the data lifecycle stages they address, as well as a few other categories. And in a few cases, we're um, working on resources. Um, we know the end result won't be a finished product though. So once we have a draft, we're going to ask for feedback and add resources that might come up and revise as needed. And then we're talking with NCID to see how best to present the toolkit to their scholars. Um, one thing we saw in the survey was that even our example resources, we got some excited comments of like, oh, I didn't know about this, now I'm going to use it. And so we're hoping to engage with their community building efforts um, by creating the centralized resource that scholars can share with their peers and colleagues who may also have similar needs and then may also be able to continue sharing resources back to add as well. So the results of our research are not necessarily surprising, but they do map onto what we know to be problematic aspects of the research infrastructure, tends to emphasize speed and productivity over building and delivering on right relationships. Um, data management and any type of ethics take time and labor, and it's difficult to make time for steps that aren't incentivized. This can have especially high stakes when scholars are doing diversity work and or when scholars have identities themselves that might make them vulnerable. We also know that for this work to be successfully prioritized and completed, it has to be supported at an institutional level versus just expecting individual scholars to find their own way. Um, most survey respondents indicated that for the stages they were comfortable with, they learned about these things through self-education, trainings at their academic institutions, and advisor or mentor training. And all of these are valuable and demonstrate the dedication of diversity scholars to obtaining the knowledge and skills they need, but they're all also highly dependent on the specific context an individual scholar is in and the types of institutional and other resources they might have access to or not. And then finally, another area where um, it was really important to make more connections and we would have liked to do more, but it fell outside the scope was drawing more connections between the data life cycle from the researcher perspective and then what happens with the data after it's created, stored, shared, et cetera. Um, the types of things that were being talked about in the, key in the keynote, there's a ton of work being done around data justice, um, things like data for black lives, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and many other projects and community organizations. And finally, um, here are a few ways to learn more about our project um, and to follow us if you're interested. We have a website, it's out of date right now, but I will be updating it. And um, we have the manuscripts that I mentioned. There's also a white paper that we put out that goes into our methodology and um, like the, in a lot more detail and has the full descriptions of the data lifecycle stages and the potential toolkit resources that we used. And then hopefully very soon we'll be putting out um, our base draft of the toolkit to start soliciting feedback. Thank you. And I will
hand this back to you, Fernando. Great, thank you, Rachel. Up next, uh, we have uh, Sarah, Sarah Manheimer from Montana State University. Sarah. I think I need Rachel to stop sharing before I can share mine. Oh, there we go, cool. All right, Sarah. No worries. Okay. So um, I'm Sarah, I'm from Montana State University. I'm gonna talk about supporting responsible research with big social data by connecting communities of practice. Um, so we're, my talk, I'll define qualitative data and big social data. I'll look at connections between the two types of data, and then I'll go through a selection of issues that I've identified in data use and reuse for both types. And then I'll talk about my next steps and a call to y'all, the RDAP community. So I wanna first, I mean, I know you guys know this, the benefits of data sharing, but this is kind of the foundation of my project, the idea that data sharing is beneficial to society. And as Mothner said in 2012, the case for data sharing rests on three central pillars, the scientific, a moral, and, ec and economic one. So scientific benefits are building new knowledge, new hypotheses, new methodologies, uh, moral benefits include reducing the research on, or reducing the burden, sorry, on research subjects, facilitating research for harder to find or reach communities, et cetera. And then economic benefits are um, that data sharing can support a higher return on investment. But I just wanted to get that out there as we start as sort of an underlying assumption of my project. So let's define big social data and qualitative data. Big social data I'm thinking of as more large scale, and I've adopted this definition from Ola Shanakova um, in 2017. Um, digital self-representation data like login data, profile pictures, social interaction data like timeline posts, content sharing, direct messaging. And then there's more metadata e type data like digital relationships data, which is likes and follower following data and timestamps, geospatial data, et cetera. So when I'm, for my project, I'm looking more at these first two types of data, which strike me as more similar to qualitative data. This is um, actual posts content that people are creating purposefully. And so for qualitative data, um, there's two sort of subsets that I'm looking at. There's data that's actually solicited as part of research studies, field notes, observational records, interviews, et cetera. And then there's data that researchers can find like found diaries, correspondence, home videos, um, things like that. And I also wanna define qualitative data reuse. So the definition I'm going with is adopted from Heaton in 2004. She says qualitative data reuse is when researchers use existing qualitative data to gain new insights to produce new scholarship. So this is where the connection comes in. So I'm thinking of big social data like tweets, Facebook and Reddit posts and shared photos as sort of existing qualitative data that users have shared online. And then when these data are used for academic research, it's this idea that they're being used to gain new insights and produce new scholarships. So that those are the key parts of my qualitative data reuse definition. And so the idea is that by connecting these two communities of practice that I feel have historically been underconnected, um, we'll be able to improve both. So big social data research and curation are less well developed and Whereas qualitative research and qualitative data curation are more established, we have good qualitative data repository. We have standardized ways of curating qualitative data, although there are still questions, which I'll talk about later. Um, so I did, in order to get my research started, I reviewed a bunch of literature and I identified these six key issues, epistemological issues of context, data quality, and data comparability and then ethical and legal issues of informed consent, privacy and confidentiality and intellectual property. And I, just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna talk about the ethical and legal issues today. So let's start with informed consent. Um, it was really interesting to hear the keynote speaker talk about this. And I feel like we still haven't found sort of perfect strategies for informed consent. 
but it is similar for both qualitative data reuse and big social data. Um, we're increasingly adding broad consent language to consent um, agreements when we're um, conducting research, but um, questions are still there about whether that consent can ever be fully informed. You can't be sure uh, what your data will be used for in the future and data use agreements can help with that, which I'll talk about uh, when we talk about intellectual property. But um, this is a, a huge issue that I identified. And of course, with social media, terms of service could include user agreements that have language about consent, but we know that it's rare that users read the terms of service. And even if they do, they because of the large scale of big social research, um, they may not know exactly what their data are being used for. So I also identified some data curation strategies that are being used to help support consent for data reuse and big social data. Um, that broad consent language that says, I agree to my data being used and then being shared. And then for big social data, there's some emerging ideas about strategies like um, convening focus groups of sort of representative members of the community that you're looking at and talking through like what might be what might be appropriate to consent to in these situations. And then there's some other tools um, that are popping up about automated strategies for getting informed consent from individuals as you collect the data. There's a project called the Digital Footprints Project in our house university that um, does some of that and others. Uh, privacy and confidentiality, um, both major issues for qualitative data reuse and big social data. Um, for qualitative data reuse, anonymization could potentially compromise the integrity and quality of the data because you have to remove maybe important contextual information and context, which I'm not talking about today because of time, but that is such a major issue in qualitative data reuse. Researchers who create qualitative data embed in communities and they co-create data with their communities. And so just sharing the words themselves is, can like not be enough. And so then by anonymizing, um, you can remove even more of that contextual information. And then for big social data, anonymization is really difficult, if not impossible. Lots of the social media platforms are full text searchable, which means if you put a quote from any user that can be searched in the, um, on the tool or on the open web and you can identify the user. Um, and also it's large scale, the large scale of big social data means that it's easier to um, deduce identify identities. Um, there was a famous, uh, example a few years ago, the Taste Ties and Time data set, which was released like, oh, all this data from Facebook that we have de identified and made available for you, the researcher. Um, but Michael Zimmer um, looked into it and he very quickly was able to deduce that all of the students were from Harvard and various other things about them. So, um, and then one last note on privacy and confidentiality um, big social data could be considered publicly available online since people post it, but there is this idea um, sort of popularized by Dana Boyd that even though the posts and, and Michael Zimmer wrote this um, article called, but the data that are already public, um, it's like the data are online, but when you post, you're posting to speak to your own social media community and you may not think that your data will go further than that. Um, to be used, especially in academic research. And all throughout, the idea is that um, academic research has these, um, this is a side note, sorry, has these very um, more specific ethical guidelines. We go through IRB, we have these ideas about what we can and can't do with academic research. So that's why I'm scoping um, to academic research rather than use for analytics or journalism or anything like that. Um, so for privacy and confidentiality, we data curators can help by supporting de-identification procedures um, and also repositories can provide restricted access and data use agreements that can sort of control how these data are used. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about intellectual property. With qualitative data, it's a little more straightforward. The 
data are the intellectual property of the research participants. And when you're doing the study, you can get consent from them to either um, waive their rights or license their content for your specific use cases. But with big social data, it's more complex because most of this data comes from social media platforms that are for profit, private companies. And so even if the contents of the post are the intellectual property of the user, um, the social media companies can put limits on the behavior of users, developers, researchers, and archivists about how the data can be used. So for example, with Twitter, you're only supposed to share the tweet ID number. And um, so in response, there have been some tools developed like DocNow's Hydrator tool, which takes the tweet ID and pulls back um, the full tweet metadata that's if it's live on the web. So some curation strategies we can use here is we can support data licensing for new data um, as part of the initial consent agreements if you're doing qualitative research. And then again, maybe at the point of data archiving and sharing, you can reach back out to the participants. Um, and then we can also help users of um, archive data with rights management, how they are allowed to use data that they have collected either from big social, uh, either from social media platforms or if they've found it on in an archive. And so that can include navigating those social media terms of service and thinking about um, when they're publishing data, including um, things like a link to the hydrator tool that can help future users um, use the data that they're publishing. So my next steps um, are to talk with qualitative researchers, big social data researchers, and data curators. And the goal is to understand, better understand, and compare practices in both communities with the goal of identifying more strategies that we can use as data curators to support responsible research through data curation in both of these communities. And so that's where my call to you comes. I had thought that I would at least have some preliminary interview data today, but um, I don't <laughs> and so, because of COVID and other factors. And so um, what's great is now I'm reaching out to interview subjects. So if you've curated qualitative or big social data. And if you're willing to be interviewed by me for about an hour, hour and a half, um, please contact me. I put my email here and my Twitter handle. Um, I think it will be fun to talk together. So reach out. All right, thanks. That's all I've got. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, and finally, um, our last uh, panelists are uh, Nina Exner and Aaron Carrillo from Virginia Commonwealth University, and Sa uh, Sam Leif from the University of Nevada, Nevada, Las Vegas. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nina, and we're going to talk about the uh, sometimes forgotten topic of demographic data sheets. And we're, we want to present a sort of a think piece for you on data consultations and data management consultations with a race, an anti-racist uh, or colonial critique perspective on when talking about demographic data sheets. Uh, we are, I'm Nina, your resident data talking head, and with me are Erin Carrillo from VCU, my institution, and Sam Leif from UNLV. We are not anti-racism experts, but for your um, consideration, we're presenting these assumptions that we come to the idea with. First, that anti-racism as an approach begins with the premise that racism is both visibly and invisibly embedded in the status quo. And therefore, all structures, all policies have racism somewhere hiding in them, or obvious. And thus, that anti-racist research needs to start with the premise that racism is hiding in the research status quo and all of its structures and policies. We also take, uh, as part of our lens, the idea that there are no spaces that are not colonized. And so decolonization of research needs to start. It can't finish with this because 
colonized people need to be involved in true decolonization. It can't be a settler only effort. But decolonization needs to start with or include the assumption that there is no knowledge space that is uncolonized. And therefore, the colonial privilege is throughout uh, who has had the reputation to create existing guidance uh, and publications and education and so on. I highly recommend a recent school of uh, emerging thought called QuantCrit. And from QuantCrit, I bring this statement that, that data groups are neither natural nor given. Um, so when you see race as a category, read racism into it. Just assume that it's hiding there somewhere. But for realsies, I'm a data librarian, so we have to have a data life cycle somewhere in this presentation. Our part of the data life cycle is the part where the loop closes, uh, mainly concentrating on the sharing to the next design. We also assume that data management uh, is affect data management practices and choices affect future research, and so analytical transformations and recodings that we do lead into sharing of variables and so on. And that's then uh, affected by the taxonomies and schema in our repository. And then from there, that affects the next generation. So we talk about things like that, right? During our consultations, hopefully. A lot of times people don't pay any attention. But, you know, we do what we can. Mostly when I talk about data management planning, I tend to think about interoperability and fair data and stuff like that. And um, so I think about the ontologies they're going to use. And I think about common data elements for the variables. And um, so what if, in addition to thinking about interoperability, I also thought about the socially constructed parts of concepts. Now, are racial variables really social constructs? Um, I was I was initially going to use a, a racial variable of personal interest the, uh, that included the Squamish people. Then I thought, well, no one is going to know who the Squamish people are. But then I heard someone mention the, um, I'm sorry, I'm checking to see if someone said, I just heard an alert and I thought it was my time ding. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, then I heard someone mention the Duwamish people. And so now I feel like I should have maybe gone with that, but maybe more people will know Asian Americans. Asian Americans census defines as people whose parents, grandparents, ancestry comes from anywhere in Southeast Asia or the Indian subcontinent or the Far East. So places as diverse as the Philippines to Mongolia to Pakistan. Now, let's think about that. Is this a, st a social construct? Geographically, that's a larger space than any other continent. Genetically, that area has more haplogroups than any other continent. <laughs> you could actually combine Europe and another continent and still get the same rough number of haplogroups as currently established in science. So they're not scientifically grounded. So why do we combine such diverse heritages uh, from American immigration, remembering that we are all of immigrant heritage at least partly. Is that for knowledge purposes? It's originally for policy making reasons. Um, so in the 70s, there was a uh, data heritage of lots and lots of, of, of racism and exclusionary practices that varied depending on the interests of the individual state. In the 70s, after a lot of the civil rights policies came in, policymakers needed to be able to estimate the scopes of the needs and the breadth of policy impacts and policy change costs. And so the OMB created a standardized racial group so we could have at least some, play, some common discussion of policies, but they specifically said that that should not be interpreted as being scientific or anthropological in nature. Um, so 
I'll let you think for yourself. When we take these census categories determined by the OMB for policy reasons, and we put them into our research, are we following this uh, advice that they should not be interpreted as being in any way scientific or anthropological in nature? Let's check the common data elements. Data librarian, interoperability, I work with health. When we look for common data elements, I find 62 entries for race, 66 for ethnicity, and seven, because it's a much broader, more inclusive concept, for ancestry. So I can't really call those best practices, uh, but there is a lot of repetition, but not universality among them. So then I would normally, in a consult, ask my researcher, which of these reflects the research question that you want to ask? I suggest also asking, taking for a leaf from community-based, uh, community participatory research, and also asking which identities are relevant to the community that you're working with. And I think we should consider in our, in our ethical or anti-racist data life cycle, a third, what would be meaningful to the future if people from that community we're working with then become researchers and try to build on that research for a future study. My time is up, so I'm going to pass on to Erin Carrillo to look at how this affects the next group of researchers. Thanks, Nina. So I work with an undergraduate health sciences course entitled Health Disparities, and one of the biggest projects requires them to collect health statistics and compare between racial and ethnic groups and across different geographic levels using a variety of sources, mostly federal. Next slide. So I wanna take a step back and ask the question, why does the US classify people by race? And as Nina mentioned at first, it was to explicitly exclude people based on race. Um, and in the mid 20th century, we began to study racial inequities with the aim of correcting them. Next slide. To this end, in 1977, the federal government created standards for collecting racial and ethnic data. And you can see that Asian or Pacific Islander was one racial category. In 1997, this was updated to create two new categories, Asian and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And this was in response to advocacy by Native Hawaiians. Next slide. I've had the opportunity to watch the health sciences students present. And one thing that several groups mentioned was the Hispanic health paradox, which states that Hispanic Latina people live longer and have lower death rates from health disease, cancer, and many of the other leading causes of death than non-Hispanic white residents, despite having social disadvantages including lower incomes and worse access to health coverage. But focusing on national data can mask important differences linked to whether Hispanic Latina people have health insurance, um, speak primarily Spanish or English, or grow up in the US or another country. So for example, high rates of diabetes, liver disease, and certain cancers and poor birth outcomes among some Hispanic Latina groups. The latter of which you can see illustrated in this graph, which shows that Puerto Ricans had a higher infant mortality rate in 2014 than Cubans, Mexicans, Central and South Americans, and non-Hispanic whites. You can also see that health is generally worse among Hispanic Latina people born in the U.S. compared to those born in other countries. A 2016 study examined the relationship between race and Hispanic ethnicity, maternal and child nativity, and country of origin, and asthma among non-Hispanic white and Hispanic children across 65 Los Angeles neighborhoods, and found that while lifetime asthma prevalence was reported among 9% of children, with no significant differences between Hispanic and non-Hispanic whites overall, Hispanic children of non-Mexican origin reported higher odds of asthma compared to non-Hispanic white children and a protective nativity effect was also observed among children of foreign-born mothers compared to U.S.-born mothers. Next slide. To revisit the Asian Pacific Islander category, by 1997, the Federal Office of Management and Budget had changed to allow different categories for Asian and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. But the umbrella Asian Pacific Islander term has stuck, and in state-level health statistics, I've seen this category persist. 
So currently, some Pacific Islander community leaders are advocating to disaggregate Pacific Islander from Asian Americans to reflect the reality of the Pacific Islander experience. Pacific Islander or Pacifica people are those originating or living in Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. Pacific Islander communities face significant health and socioeconomic disparities compared to other groups. In most measures, such as poverty rates and health outcomes, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander people fall behind white Americans as well as behind Asian Americans. And nowhere are those disparities more evident than with COVID-19, as you can see in this chart. In Washington, the state with the third highest number of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in the country, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have a seven times higher rate of COVID-19 cases than white and Asian American people. And now I'd like to hand it off to Sam. Thank you, Erin. Um, so if, if it affects reuse that much, why are researchers still collecting and sharing data this way? And the answer, of course, is publish or perish. One of the ideas that has come out recently in a misguided attempt to address racism is to call for including race in every study. Considering the awareness that racial categories have little to do with actual homogeneity, this will lead to misleading inferences and perpetuating prejudices rather than improving data sharing and research outcomes. Next slide. Uh, so obviously submitting manuscripts is a harrowing process. Um, thanks for viewer two. Uh, when it comes to reporting demographics of research participants, editors tend to defer to governmental state health agency definitions as unwritten rules. Reporting outside of these are sometimes considered inappropriate terminology and you'll get your manuscript sent back to you. This is entirely up to the whim of editors or reviewers and it perpetuates the injustices of recognition because, you know, unsurprisingly, the majority of academics that are reviewing papers are white cis males. Um, next slide. To attempt to overcome this, uh, the whim factor, some journal publishers put out protocols or standards for authors and more and more are doing this, which is great to see. As an example here, the publisher lists as their reporting standards for authors to remove social constructs from race from, from submitted publications. Um, and they, they say ancestry invites examination of descent, specification of depth. Ethnicity deals with the social and cultural factors that may exert environmental influences. And once ancestry and ethnicity have been described, the residual information in race is the legacy of discrimination. Those are the kinds of statements that we want to see. However, if you look at an example of an article from their most recent pub, from their most recent uh, journal, their issue, um, you can see that they still use racial headings, which echo that legacy of discrimination. If they aren't applying their own standards with fidelity, can we trust that the reviewers don't still have the power or the whim to send the manuscript back for revision in demographic reporting? Journal pub publications are increasingly crossing borders. Societal and cultural clashes meeting differing definitions, as my colleagues have mentioned today. The more global we get, the less chance to overcome potential editor and reviewer bias. Publishers and reviewers must step up to address this at the publisher parish level. And I hand it back to Nina to conclude for us. So these are some points we hope that you'll bring to your future uh, consultations, especially as I think I saw fly by in some chat or maybe on the Discord. Um, people who are like, oh no, all the categories are 100% real and solid and we should totally follow those forever. So time, thanks. I don't know how to stop sharing. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nina and all the presenters. So we have some time for questions and there are some popping up in the chat. So let me start off with actually the first one that I saw come in uh, for Sarah. Uh, what methods have been tried for de-identifying free text posts? Uh, I guess the main one I've seen has been to change the words so that they have the same meaning, but, or, you know, a similar meaning, but are different words so that they can't be, um, searched. It's sort of like a pseudonymization um, process. Uh, 
Okay, uh, thank you. Next question, uh, also for Sarah. Regarding data use agreements, do you use any standard agreements? Would you recommend? Uh, gosh, I don't have a standard one I use. I guess I would point you to qualitative data repository or ICPSR if you're um, looking at social science data. They both have really good resources there um, that would be specific to the social science and the qualitative contexts. Sorry, these are simple answers. <laughs> if you have follow-ups, please, please go ahead. Uh, next question also for Sarah. Uh, will you expand on the digital footprints project you mentioned while you covered informed consent? Yeah, it's, I think that they launched in um, the mid 2010s. So I'm not sure how much they're doing now, but at, it, they, the idea is that um, there would be, you could, it's an automatic way to go through, it's not for Facebook only, I think, where you go through and you can, as you're collecting your data pop, um, like give people the option to opt in to your study. So it's like an add-on or, you know, like a plug-in for Facebook. So you can register with them and then you'll be able to collect Facebook data, getting informed consent automatically from people as you go. So um, it might limit your data set, but it does allow for users to opt in to the research and know what the research is. Okay, we have a question for Rachel. What resources do you feel are needed to fill gaps, if any, in the toolkit? Oh yes, definitely. I'm sure there are gaps. Um, so we're in the process right now of going through and sort of assigning the different resources that we have to the data lifecycle stages. Um, and I think, uh, and also thinking about inclusion criteria because there are so many more available now than there were when we started. Um, and thinking about the types of tools. So like the, the feminist data manifest no was something that came up um, and something that we were um, looking at, but then also thinking about how, um, sorry, how much guidance we need to be able to provide on like applying things or uh, one of the options that we suggested in our survey was a bibliography, but that was actually like the least desired option because it would take so much time. Um, I think that one of the one of the things we asked about that we I don't think have good resources on at this point um, was like hidden metadata or for researchers to really understand um, what implications there might be to the metadata that's attached to the file formats that they're using. Um, and then data accessibility is also another big area where it's still, I think that's a conversation that's starting to happen. And so um, that's really exciting. And we're working on um, a limited resource uh, talking about data accessibility um, that hopefully will be ready soon to be included in the toolkit. But if anybody knows of anything um, that is useful or you think would be useful, I would love to hear about it. Feel free to to contact me because I think it's going to be a long, and I hope a long process of um, iteration and revision. Okay, uh, and then a question for Nina, Aaron, and Sam. How on earth do we get beyond the US government's basic race categories? They're everywhere. Uh, Aaron or Sam, do either of you want to take it? Without seeing them unmute. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Do you have an answer? Um, well, in it depends, of course. Hmm? But try asking how the community being studied works. I mean, it may be that what you really want is black and non-black. And while I've seen lots of white and non-white, I don't see a whole lot of black and non-black in studies and maybe that's really we you know if we're looking for the health health disparities affecting the african-american community maybe that would be the one that's actually relevant uh might make roll-up for interoperability a bit tough um but i'm not entirely sure i'm convinced that most of my people who are just tossing like i'm gonna do a demographic data sheet just in case i might explore and find something interesting i'm not convinced that they're like putting serious thought to the interoperability of those either Meh. 
Um, but community-based participatory research is going to have some some really good choices to look at, just as a possibility. Erin? I have nothing to add to that. Thanks, Nina. I would throw out there, just kind of speaking to what I said before as well, that part of it is publishing, right? Like, if we can lead the charge as reviewers, if we can have publishers stick to better definitions and better explanations and less, you know, uh, racist and, and colonizing views of how to publish and how to report these things, that starts the change, as well as data repositories. How is the data being stored? And if you have uh, any ability to reach out to the people that manage that, uh, the ability to help, you know, address those issues. And for your super, super sciencey policy positivist people, I'm going to actually say go back to the haplogroups. If we find a haplogroup, a, a genetic grouping, where there is a, like a thing that people do to try to genetically group commonalities. If we haven't found a genetic commonality that indicates it's a group, then it's not, maybe it's not a sciency group. Uh, that probably isn't actually going to help anyone's research, but it, it, it might, except maybe in biomedical, but it might be a place to sort of break that conversation. I think that would also be a great uh, sort of conversation starter for things like RCR training and stuff like that. Good. Uh, any other questions? We have a couple of minutes left that anybody else um, wants to chime in. Okay, I'm not seeing anything come through. So I think uh, I'll hand it back to you, uh, Amelia and Reed. Thank you, Fernando. And thank you to all of our panelists. It was great for you to kick off our very first panel. We are now gonna to transition to a break as well as to our networking space in Gathertown. So I'm just gonna pull up the schedule real quick to give you some times. Um, so we have a, a 10 minute break scheduled, but it sort of bleeds right into our 30 minute break of networking and sponsor activity in Gathertown. So our next session is lightning talks, which will start at noon Pacific time. Um, so we have um, a little over half an hour to spend in Gathertown or to simply take a break and come back for Lightning Talks. So thank you all for joining us for this first session of RDAP Day 1. And we'll see you either in Gathertown and then we'll see you back for our Lightning Talks and second panel. Thank you, everyone.
Figshare is an easy-to-use research data repository system that allows academics to make all of their research outputs available in a citable, shareable, and discoverable manner. It also allows research data managers to manage the curation of files, keep account of their institution's research outputs, and measure the impact of those outputs. You can quickly and easily upload any file on Figshare, from PDFs, papers, and datasets, to code, 3D printable files, and video. You control the ownership, the storage, the DOIs, the licenses, and the metadata. And we take care of the rest. Thank you. 